All right, we're getting a little bit closer. Finish line is in sight, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. We're not going to burn ourselves out on it. We're going to keep going slow and steady, plugging away at this till we've got all the subjects we need so we're ready for our AP. So we're moving on to a new section now. We're on chapter 26. This is comparing counts. We're going to introduce our new chi-squared model. We're going to talk about what the chi-squared model is. We're going to look at how statistics to test for goodness of fit. It's important. We're looking for goodness of fit, a test for homogeneity for distributions of categorical variables, as well as testing for independence of categorical variables. We're going to talk about the assumption and conditions, go about them some step-by-step -step examples. We're going to look at how we can use residuals to better interpret the results of our test. However, there are three tests. We just talked about them. three tests that use the chi-squared distributions. Test number one answers the question, is an observed distribution consistent with what we expect. So is an, is an set of observations, are they consistent with what our expectations were for that, those observations? Test number two, are the groups homogeneous? Are they the same? Test number three, are the two categorical variables I have in mind here independent from one another? Now in class, we broke section one into our first day. We did a little bit of lab inside the class. We're going to use some of that information from the lab and the examples here and out to keep working through it. And we're going to go over parts two and three on a separate day. So this is a two-day exercise to work through these. The chi-square statistic is going to be used for the analysis. Previous statistics we've used, we had to use the x-bar. We had to use a sample mean. We've had to use sample proportions. Well, now we have one called the chi-square. We find it by taking our sum, that's a summation, of individual observation minus the expected value for that category, squaring that, and dividing by the expected value. We're going to have n minus 1 degrees of freedom, but for goodness of fit, n is the number of categories we had. And we're going to work through an example and we'll see how these work out. We actually have some other names for different parts that we're going to talk about later. That observed minus the expected that's a residual, just like when we did scatter plots. The observed data point minus the point that the line would have given me was a residual. We have the same thing here. Now, the chi-square, let's talk a little bit about this distribution. I have all these pictures up here. Okay, There are properties for the chi-square density curves. First of all, it's, it's like the normal curve and like the t tables that we've had, the students' t distributions, the total area under the curve is 1. However, chi-square is always non-negative in value. The curve starts at zero and extends on to the right. Now, if you look at these drawings, I have different drawings because they represent different degrees of freedom. Specifically because the distribution is not symmetrical, it is skewed to the right, but as the degrees of freedom increase, the chi-square distribution becomes more symmetric and approaches a normal distribution. In fact, if you look at this drawing in the lower left-hand side, the red line would represent having a single degree of freedom. The blue line represents may have two or three. As you progress to higher degrees of freedom, you become more normal. It is a little bit of diminishing returns, though, in that you take more degrees of freedom to become more normal. Now, our picture we have off on the right is we're showing that we're going to have a certain value. We're going to shade. It's always a one-tail test with the chi-square test. And that shaded area is going to give us our p-value. We're going to work through an example. We'll see what different p-values are and how we get those. We'll look for certain behavior we see in that. We have assumption and conditions for a chi-square goodness of fit test. So all we're doing for right now is just a goodness of fit. First one is we had to have counted data. If it turns out the data I have in my categories are not counts but as proportions, I need to convert it back to a count. So if they've given me proportions, but they told me the sample size, I need to do that multiplication and get back to the counts. I need counts in these. Second, I have to have my independence assumption to be met. Individual counted cells are sampled independently. In order to do this, first of all, it should have been a random sample. And secondly, just like last time, and just like every time, I, shouldn't, I have to sample less than 10% of the population. Okay. So my independent assumption hasn't really changed. Randomization, standard 10%, I'll get independence. Next, I have one new condition that we have. 
the same. It's based on the sample size assumption. I have to not have enough data for the method to work. The way I'm going to find that out is when I do my expected values. I have to have at least five in each cell of expected value, not necessarily observations. I may not have anything for my observations, but my expected values need to be at least five. We'll go into that and how we use that. So let's go ahead and try this. And our null, and let's talk a little bit about our goodness fit, our null hypothesis. The null hypothesis for goodness fit is always the same hypothesis. First of all, we will always give these in words, not symbols. And the words are very simple. My null hypothesis is that my distribution of data matches my theoretical distribution. My, the my distribution of data matches my theoretical distribution of data. And that's what we're actually checking for. It's a kind of a reverse from before. Previously, we put what we're trying to show in an alternative. Now we're trying to show it inside of our null. Now, alternative, we're only going to be able to reject or fail to reject our null. That hasn't changed. We're not going to prove or accept anything. But we're going to find out, is our data consistent with our theory? Our alternative is simply that the data isn't consistent with the distribution that we had in mind. So let's go ahead and try this. We're going to talk about the example we did in class. We talk about M&Ms. Is an observed distribution consistent with what we expected? Now, we had your individual, we had, this was the Mars company distribution of data. They said 13% of M&Ms are brown, 14% yellow, 13% red, 24% blue, 20% orange, 16% green. We all had our bags of M&Ms, we worked through them, we came up with our samples, figured out our own individual counts, and we collectively got some data. But before we do this, our first question was, what was the parameter of interest? What were we looking at? We were simply looking at, the true proportion of each color. How many in my bag were brown? How many were yellow, red, blue, orange, green? That's what we counted. That was our proportion. Our true proportion of each color, that's what we're looking into. Our null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. First of all, the distribution of candy colors is as the manufacturer claimed. It's the null. There's nothing going on. It's what the manufacturer claimed. Our data is in line with the theory. Alternative is simply that the candy colors are not what the manufacturer claimed. Now, in order to do this, we'll, these are what we're trying to show. So let's go ahead and do this. It's a little bit different than before. We don't check our conditions yet. We actually have to get that expected value before we can check our conditions. Now, as we went through, we were getting this data. We had our group data. I'm pulling mine back up. We're going to have to put it back in here. Okay. We worked through that we had as a class, we added it all up, we had 1,245 total in our samples. Of those, 134 were brown, 291 were blue, we had 270 were orange, we're going to try to not let it Mess those up too bad. Green, we had 206. Red, we had 174. Yellow, we had 170. And those all add up to 1,245. I'm going to try to fix that 291 while we're at it. Just be nice if that wasn't messed up also. Okay. Now our expected values. We use those percentages from the Mars company to figure out what our what we expected to have happen. So we took that 13% for brown, multiplied by 1,245, and we had 161.85. So remember, my counts, my observations should always be whole numbers. My expected very often will not be. Now for our blue, our expected was 298.8. For orange, we had 249. It happened to work out 20%. Worked out to just a nice round number. For green, 
we had 199.2. And we'll fix it since we're here. I want to make these easy to read. 199.2. For red, we had 161.85. Finally, for yellow, our expected was 174.3. Now, because all of these values came from the 1,245, we should have this total also be 1,245. But just to make sure, I'll add them separately on a calculator. I have here the side. So I have 161.5 plus 298.8 plus 249 plus 199.2, plus 161.85, plus 174.3. I add all those up and I get 1,245. So the reason I do this, so I'm kind of double checking. If I typed in one of my percentages incorrectly, this count would have been wrong. My new total would have been incorrect. At this point, I can check my conditions. I'm going to go forward and check conditions. We're going to come back to this page. Because remember, my conditions were, so there were a number of conditions I had to have. First of all, I needed to have, the data had to be counts of categorical data. Now, if I look, my categories, I have brown, blue, orange, green, red, and yellow. They are counts, 134, 291, 270. I've counted categorical data. Secondly, my sample had to be less than 10% of all the candies made. Well, I have 1,245. So if I multiply 10 times 1,245, that gives me 12,450. That's far less than all the M&Ms they produce. La nextly, I had to have expected value of at least five candies of each color. And I've kind of skipped over the randomization. They were a random sample. We had a random sample of each bag. They can be considered a random sample. But my expected value had to be at least five candies of each color. Let's go back and look. My expected values so we're talking about our expected had to be at least five of each color. And we have that. Each of my expecteds are at least five of each color. So we've met that. My expected counts. My observations didn't have to meet. In fact, if you remember some of us in our individual counts, our observations were below five. But all of our expecteds were above five. Okay. So next, we've met all of our conditions. We can continue this with a chi-square test, and we're going to have five degrees of freedom. I have six categories, so I have five degrees of freedom. So now I want to find my next row. My observed minus my, expect, my expectations. So I have 134 minus 161.85. So I find negative 27.85. I have 291 minus 298.8. Negative 7. 8. 270 minus 249, that's going to give me a positive, oh, that's not quite 30, I'm sorry, 21. 206 minus 199, so that's going to be 6.8. 174 minus 161.85, so I'm going to do that when I calculate, 174 minus 161.85, that gives me 12.15. 170 minus 174, that's negative 4.3. Now I need to square each of these residuals. Negative 27.85 squared gives me 775.6225. 7.8, that's negative. Squaring it gives me 60.84. 21 squared gives me 441. 6.8 squared gives me 46. 46.24. 12.15, 12 12.15 squared, 147.24. 6225. We had negative 4.3. Squaring that, we came out to 18.49.
Now we're going to take these squared residuals and divide them by the expected value. So let's go back through. We've got our 775.6225. We're going to divide that by 161.85. So we had 4.79. And it goes on a little bit further than that, but we can stop at that second decimal. Now we had our 60.84. And we're going to divide that by 298.8. So we had 0 0.20, and we can put that 3 on there. It won't hurt. 441 divided by 249. And we had 1.77. And we can throw that 1 on the end. It won't hurt. 46.24 divided by 199.2. We had 0.232. 147.6225, dividing that by 161.85, we had 0.9, it's a little difficult sometimes, but it's not that bad, 0.912. Last, we had 18.49 divided by 174.3, 0.1. 0, 06. Now we can add these together and we'll get the sum of our chi squares. 0 0.106 plus 0 0.912 plus 0 0.232. I'm working from right to left. Plus 1.771 plus 0 0.203 plus 4.79. So our total sum is 8.0. One, and I put that four on the end, won't hurt. So 8.01, that's our sum. So let's see how we're gonna use this. We already checked our conditions. We're gonna proceed over our chi squared units of fit test for five degrees of freedom. We said it was 8.01. Now we're gonna do that, we have our table. We're gonna use our table to solve this one first. So what we're gonna do is we wanna look at this table, we find our five degrees of freedom. And what we're looking for is where would that 8.01 be? If I look at this, the way this table is set up, let's spend just a moment on this table. Go to our highlighter for a moment. So looking at our right tail probability, and if we look, it proceeds from left to right in decreasing probability. So as we progress from left to right, the probability goes down, which means going from right to left, the probability must be increasing. Our value we're looking for is 8.01. If we look, our table starts with 9.2. As we progress to the right, the values are increasing. I want that as a pen. Our values are increasing. 8.01 is therefore going to be on this side of the table. And looking at our probabilities, that means my p-value must be greater than 0.1. Since my p-value is greater than 0.1, well, first of all, we never defined where our significance level was going to be. We didn't define our alpha. But if we think about it, 0 0.01 seems a bit much to make it. 0 0.1, well, we're talking about a lot of money goes into M&Ms and how canes are sold and how many they make them. So 0 0.1 might be too shallow. But 0.05 seems reasonable for a level of significance. Well, my p-value is greater than 0.1. My p-value exceeds my alpha. So my large p-value of, uh, I'm sorry, let's, let's try this again. With the way we've got our data, we didn't use a calculator to get an exact p-value. So we can say, since my p-value exceeds 0.1, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, I have no evidence that the distribution of candies is not the way Mars Company says it is. Now, if we also look at this table, since we have it here for a moment, if we look as our degrees of freedom increase, so 
Let's use these degrees of freedom increase. The chi-squared value also has to get larger in order to maintain that same probability. And in fact, this kind of makes sense. There's a certain sense to it. That if I had higher degrees of freedom, that means I have more categories. The more categories I have, we'll go back to so and see this, the more categories I have, then the more values I'm going to have to add up. It would make sense that the more values I have to add, the larger those values could become, and therefore I would need a larger value, a larger chi-squared, in order to maintain the same probability. So as we see, as the degrees of freedom increase, to maintain that same probability it requires a larger chi-squared. But at this point, with ours of 8.01, that's greater than 0.1 for our p-value. That's too high. It exceeds any significance level I could have used. Now, if I'd use my calculator to solve this, this is how I do it. Now, I have a single bag of M&Ms here, where I observe 6, 15, 10, 9, 12, and 8. So if I remember, this should be 20, 30, 45, 51, 60. This is if I had 60 candies in my total. Then my expected value has been 7.8, 8.4, 7.8, 14.4, 9.6, .4, and 12. Now what I can do is I enter my observed list into L1. I, expect, I enter my expected values into L2. Using those, or I could have created an expected values list by putting the proportions in L2 and then calculating L3 by doing my sample size times L2. This one, I'd already done it, so I put them both in L1 and L2. Then I'd run the stat. I do stat test, and it's under D, the chi-squared goodness of fit test. It's going to ask me for my observed data, my expected value, my degrees of freedom. I put it in, it would give me a chi-square of 10, a p-value of 0 0.07, and then C and T R B. We haven't talked about what that is, and honestly, you won't really need it in the class. Uh, we, we can talk some more about it later, but it's not terribly useful if you've already had your individual values. In fact, what that CNTRB is, I misremembered it earlier. I thought it was a different set of values. I'll go back and show what it is. Uh, it is, in this case, it would be 6 minus, oh, let's do a different color. That's not going to work. That first one, well, that's 6 minus 7.8. Square it and then divide it by six. So if we take that in our calculator and I do six minus seven point eight, and I square that value and then divide it by seven point eight, I get 0.415384. It's all of my individual values that I would have had to add up. Now I misremembered what this was earlier and said it was something else when we were in class. So it's each one of these values. And if while this screen is on your calculator, while you have this screen loaded, if you arrow to the right, you'll get each one of these values. So you can actually list out in a problem and show what values you added up in order to get the chi-squared value. Right? So that's how I can use my calculator to do this type of setup. Now, that finished up how to do a goodness of fit test. That was our example of it. Next one we have is test two. And answer the question, are the proportions for two or more groups on the same categorical variable, are those the same? Are these groups homogenous? The statistics calculations for this are identical to the goodness of fit test. The only difference is in how the data is presented. At goodness of fit, we compare distribution to a theoretical distribution. For this test, we're comparing our distribution with another distribution to see if they're similarly arranged. So let's try an example. Uh, I'm sorry, we have assumption conditions. They're identical to goodness of fit. Are they counts of data? Were they independent? You know, were we random and standard 10% of the population? Did we have at least five for each of our expected values? Our statistic is still the chi-squared. It's the sum of the residuals squared divided by the expected value where I have n degrees of freedom. But now my degrees of freedom is found by taking the number of rows and subtracting one, and multiplying it by the number of columns and subtracting one. 
But let's try an example. Medical researchers have enlisted 90 subjects for an experiment comparing treatments for depression. The subjects are randomly divided into three groups. So we take one sample and we make three groups out of it. Each of those are given pills to take for a period of three months. Now, unknown to the participants, one group just receives a placebo. The second group is going to receive the natural remedy of St. John's wort. And the third group receives a prescription drug, Presorex. After six months, psychologists and physicians, who also don't know which treatment each person received, evaluate the subject to see if their depression returned. So while we're looking at this, what kind of study is this? Is this is an observational or is it experiment? So think about it. Right? You should be coming to that this is obviously some type of experiment. First of all, it says it's an experiment. But the real key is we messed with one of the variables. We changed what they received. Therefore, we are changing the treatments. It is an experiment. Secondly, is it single blind or is it double blind or is it not blind at all? Well, it says it's unknown to the participants which drug they get. So it's at least single blind. Then we the people who are evaluating them. They also don't know who's getting what treatment. This is a double blind experiment. After it's all done, we have our data of data. We have our table of data. The diagnosis is either depression return or there are no signs of depression. We have our three treatments. We have placebo, St. John's wort, or Prosex. We have the number of people in each. Now what we have to do is we want to run a chi-square and see is there any difference. So our hypotheses. No hypothesis. The rate of recurrence is the same for all three treatments. That they're homogenous. There's no difference. The groups are similar. Alternative. That the rate of recurrence is different for some treatments. Our model. We're going to use chi-square test for homo homogeneity. Ah, you know what? I know I'm going to keep mispronouncing that. And because of that, I decided to take the time and we're going to see how that word is pronounced correctly. Let's try it again. Homogeneity. Homogeneity. Let me try it again. Homogeneity. 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 Okay, so we've practiced that. Hopefully we can all say it properly. Homogeneity. It's a difficult word for me to say. Okay. So we have the data. Or does it match our expected counts? Now for the data to be the same, the row counts should be distributed equitably across the columns. So we're going to try to figure that out. So to find that, there's three ways we can find the expected values. First, since 30 is a third of 90, of all the subjects, that's when I got the placebo. So one third of the 60 who have recurrent depression should have been in the placebo group. So I could add up the number of people who had depression return, and a third of them should be in placebo, a third of them in St. John's, and a third of them in Prosex. The other way of doing it is since 60 of the 90 of the subjects suffered returning depression, we expect that to be true of two-thirds of the 30 who got the placebo. It's also kind of a complicated way of going about it. And lastly, I have a third method. And honestly, this is a method I prefer. It's a mindless explanation. I take the row total, multiply by the, total, by the column total, and divide it by the grand total. So 60 times 30 divided by 90 is 20. So I expect 20 under placebo for the re depression return. I expect 20 for St. John's wort and 20 for Prosex. Then also if I took my row column and my row column, I'm sorry, row total and column total for no signs of depression, I expect to have similar counts and use the exact same process. And I end up with this. Okay, so adding on these, these total columns it's just like we did our two-way contingency tables. You want those totals on there. This will make it much easier to find those values. So my expected values are my parentheticals. They're inside, they're my ones inside of the parentheses, are my parenthetical values. Those are my expected values. The way you show you expected values when you're answering this question on FRQ is you put each and every one of them in there. So put on the totals, take 60 times 30, and divide by 90 and get your 20. Take your 30, multiply 30, divide by 90, and get your 10 for your no signs of depression. And do this for each box, just like if it was a contingency table. Now, conditions, they are counts category data. The subjects were randomly assigned to treatment, so I have randomization. 
The counts in the cells are independent. No one received more than one treatment. 90 subjects are certainly less than 10% of the population of people suffering from depression. And none of my expecteds are less than five. Now, technically, if a couple of my expected counts, especially if I have a large number of degrees here, if a couple of them are a little bit below five because of decimals, I probably still use this. However, if I would end up rejecting the null, I'd have to see if those cells are the ones that caused me to reject it. So stick with our rule, they need to be the expected values, the expected counts all have to be greater than five. So let's see, in this case, I took my rows and I had two, I had two rows, subtract one, three columns, subtract one, multiply together, I have two degrees of freedom. My chi-squared is each observation minus expected and squaring it and dividing by the expected. And if I do this, I find 8.4 is my chi-squared, just using the data from our table here. 24 minus 20, 22 minus 20, 14 minus 20, 6 minus 10, 8 minus 10, 16 minus 10, squaring each one of those and dividing it by the expected count. Summing those up, I get 8.4. I go to my chi-squared table. I look at my degrees of freedom of two, and I look for where is 8.4. And 8.4 is going to fall right here between 7.3 and 9.2. And that tells me I have a chi-squared value right between 0.025 and 0.01. So my p-value, well, it's greater than 0.01, but it's less than 0.025. So depending on significance level is whether or not I'm going to accept or reject this. For some tests, depending on what significance I was assigned, I may end up rejecting the null hypothesis. Now in this case, I'm looking to see is there a difference in treatment. And considering I'm considering this, I would say yes, there is. I'm below the 0.05, accepting the alternative, that there is a difference in treatment. That is unlikely to cause anyone to lose, lose their life. Since that's the case, I can use 0.05. Remember, that's our kind of our test there. Would rejecting the null cause harm to people? My null is that there's no difference between these three medications. St. John's work, placebo, and Prosex, the prescription drug. All I'm saying is that there's a difference. I'm not saying what the difference is. The test hasn't told us what the difference is. Just is there a difference? And I'd say, yes, there's a difference. I can also use a calculator to find these values. I do second VARs. I go down to chi-squared CDF, which is 8. It asks for my lower. Well, it's 8.4. My upper eyes put three nines. I can put one E99 with two degrees of freedom. And it tells me my exact p-value. It's 0 0.0149 or 0 0.015. That's the exact p-value for this one. Uh, more exact than saying it's between 0 0.01 and 0 0.025. Since it was less than 0.05, I reject the null hypothesis. There is strong evidence that the tested treatments are not all equally effective in preventing the reoccurrence of depression. Now, it appears people who take the prescription drug are more likely to remain free of the disease. I can actually expand more than this. I haven't said how we're going to do this yet. I've got that conclusion already. Then those took placebo. Now, how do I know that? Well, I look at the residuals. Residuals are the observed minus the expected divided by the square root of the expected value. So here's my values. Now I had to take my observations, minus expected, divide by square of the expected. For placebo, that's 0.894. My residual is a little high. So a little bit more likely to have depression come back if you were on placebo compared to the others. For St. John's wort, 0.447. Not as much as placebo, but still a little bit more likely. But POSREX, negative 1.34. This is much lower than expected. So I would say it looks like Prosex is underrepresented in depression returning. And similarly, we're going to see a complementary type relationship for no signs of depression. Placebo seems overrepresented. St. John's Wort a little overrepresented. But no sign of depression, Prosex is overrepresented now. They were underrepresented for placebo and St. John's Wort, but Prosex is underrepresented. So it looks like or POSREX, POSREX, POSREX. No, no, I've never taken this one before. It looks as though they are underrepresented in depression returning and overrepresented in no sound depression. 
my residuals give me more information. Okay? I can't say how much or anything like that just from this data. I'd have to do more testing. But the chi-squared and the residuals of the chi-squared can help me expand upon that conclusion. So test three, in answer to questions, are categorical values independent of one another? The way this normally comes up is now I have a different sample and I measure two measures about those people or those units or subjects or units inside of my sample. So I might do handedness and eye color. My null hypothesis is going to be they are independent. My alternative, that there is an association. Chi-square tests. I have to have counts of categorical variables. I have to have the counts. Our sample, notice it isn't random, could be resonant for all students. We're going to do this one in class. We're going to have our data. Now, we're going to need to combine cells for students. I've got my items here we'll come back to. Okay? Because let's say I'd done a class, I had six people who were left-handed with brown eyes, 36 were right, seven who were left-handed with blue, 26 were right, two with green, 21 who were right, four who are of other eye colors and are left-handed, 12 who are otherwise. Now, I have to find the expected values. I'm still going to use my mindless method. I'm going to use my row total times column total divided by grand total. If I do that, I end up with these expected values. This is where I have the problem, but I have to combine some of my rows. If I look, green is only 3. Other is only 3.83. Other is only 2.67. Some of my cells are not at least 5. I want them to be at least 5, so I'm going to combine green and other. And this is what I'm talking about. All expected counts have to be, and they will be, greater than 5, because I'm going to combine those two rows. If I do that, my expected values, they're now on the slash. A slash 7, slash 35, slash 5.5, slash 27.5, slash 6.5, slash 32.5. How to combine the greens with those? So I'm going to run my mechanics. 6 minus 7 squared divided by 7 plus 7 minus 5.5 squared divided by 5.5. 6 minus 6.5 squared divided by 6.5. And continue, so I get 0.708. So again, now I look at my rows. I have three rows minus one, that's two. Two columns minus one, that's one. I have two degrees of freedom. My chi-square is 0.71. I go to my calculator, run my chi-square by doing second vars, chi-square CDF, 0.71, all the way to 1E99 with two degrees of freedom. My calculator is a p-value of 0.701. Since my p-value is so low, my p-value is very high. So let's look at our hypothesis again. Since my p-value is high, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. Handedness and eye color are independent. I have no evidence that there is an association between the two. At high p-value, I cannot say there's any kind of association. So these tests are kind of different compared to last time. We're going to do some practicing class on these. We're still going to have some questions we'll work through and try them as a group and try them independently. But the big question at this point should be, how do I decide between... Uh, and let's see, because I'm going to say that. Let's go ahead and ask Mr. Google to say that again for us. How do we say that? Hey, yeah, Mr. Google. Homogeneity. Homogeneity. Try it again. Homogeneity. Homogeneity. A difficult, difficult word. So how do I decide between homogeneity and independence? Well, often what we did is actually going to tell us what test we're going to use. Now, in the experiment, remember, we took a sample, we assigned people to a particular group. We weren't measuring if they were placebo, St. John's, or medication. We assigned them to those groups. We wanted to see if results varied between the three samples we created. In handedness, though, we had a sample and we measured both variables. We measured eye color, we measured handedness, or we asked it at least. We wanted to investigate for connection between those two variables from our single sample. So if we're looking at a single sample, that looks like we're going to be checking for independence. We have a single sample. We measure multiple variables. We're looking for independence between those variables. But if I have one sample with one variable and I'm looking, sorry, if I have multiple samples, which is what we kind of created, we created a sample of placebo, a sample of St. John's, a sample of medication, 
and we want to see if those three samples were all the same, that's homogeneity. So let's say, imagine we did a survey of voters, but we did a stratified survey method where we actually create a survey of Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And we ask each group how they feel about the job the president's doing. We're looking to see if the three groups are interchangeable. So you could imagine that is actually multiple samples being measured on a single variable. That's a test for homogeneity. Oh, I actually said it right that time. But instead, let's just say we took a large, simple random sample of voters. And we asked, we asked their political fish affiliation and disapproval or approval of the president. In that case, we really have one large sample where we measured multiple variables. Political, where they sit on politics, and the approval. That means we're checking for independence. If we measure multiple variables, we're looking for independence. If we assign them to their groupings and really only measure one variable, that's really about homogeneity. So this can be kind of a difficult idea to play down and which one do we want to be? And we're gonna practice that a little bit. But the, the simplest way I've seen to do it is, if I really have one sample and I've measured multiple variables, I'm looking for independence. If I have multiple samples and only looked at a single variable, I'm looking for homogeneity. Little difficult, but that's the best way I've heard it so far. So calculator test. We need to talk about the calculator test for homogeneity or independence. We showed it for how to do it for our goodness of fit. So let's look at our hand and eye color again. What we're going to have to do is build matrices inside of the calculator. And to do that, we're going to hit second x to the negative one, second reciprocal, or matrix D. When we do that, we're going to go to edit. We need to edit matrix A. And matrix A, we had to create to be a three by two matrix, three rows, two columns. And we're going to enter our observed data for matrix A. So 636, 726, 633. Now, this is my observed data. Obviously, I need my expected. So now I go back and do the same thing. I exit out, go into second matrix, edit, matrix B, a three by two, and now I load my expected values. Once I've loaded my expected values in matrix B, then I can run a test. So I go stat test. At this point, this is where I just run the chi-squared test, not the goodness of fit test, just chi-squared test. It's going to ask, where's my data? I need to tell the matrices. That's where it's looking for inside of a matrix. Matrix A is my observations. Matrix B is my expected. I tell it to calculate. And again, we had the same chi-squared. We found 0 0.708. My p-value, 0.701 with two degrees of freedom. Calculator give me all the same data, give me the same values. So again, 0.708, I failed to reject my null hypothesis due to my high p-value of 0.701. Therefore, I believe the two are independent, or I have no evidence that they're not independent. It is the same setup for homogeneity. It's the language of how we talk about our conclusion that's going to change. We're either going to say the groups are homogeneous or they're not. The last thing we have here, classwork and homework. We're gonna try the classwork and class. We'll start these. Then we'll have a few for homework so we can try our own. But the idea of doing classwork, we'll get through these, do them as a group, see what we work on, and identify the types of questions we have. So lots to go through in this section, a lot of new tests. There is some similarity, uh, but I think we can get through this without too much difficulty. Look forward to seeing you all soon in class.